This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hi, and welcome to Self Work. This is my 21st episode. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford, and I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. I've been podcasting now since October, and I'm simply delighted with the response that I'm getting. Today, we're going to be talking about going deeper into what I have called perfectly hidden depression. Actually, episodes three and four, some of my very early episodes, were about the concept or what I call a syndrome of perfectly hidden depression. It's a depression that doesn't look like classic depression. In fact, it looks almost the opposite of classic depression. And again, I did talk about it earlier in episodes three and four, but today we're going to be going a little bit deeper. First, we're going to talk about PhD or perfectly hidden depression. I'll call it PhD. It's just easier. I've called it a syndrome a few minutes ago, but what is a syndrome? We're going to go through the 10 characteristics of perfectly hidden depression that I've discovered so far. I've interviewed almost 50 people personally, and then I've gotten hundreds of emails. These characteristics, again, were mentioned in episode three, but I did not go into any detail about them. So today, that's what we're going to do. Third, I'm going to read an email from a listener about a daughter with panic attacks and how they weren't correctly diagnosed. So we'll talk about panic attacks just a little bit. And then last but not least, I have an announcement. (laughs) I'm real excited about it, so I hope you'll stay tuned in to listen to what I've got going on. I also have a special favor to ask today before we get into the content of Perfectly Hidden Depression. I can do Google Analytics on my blog, meaning I can find out, oh, the age, the gender, all kinds of things about my blog followers. But I can't do that or I don't know how to do that for a podcast. If any of you do, please let me know. But I'd like to know a little bit more about you. I can tell where you are listening from, like what country. I can tell if you're on an iPad. I can tell if you're on your mobile. I can tell if you're on a desktop. But that's about it. And I would love to hear a little bit about who you are. So I'm going to give you some ways of contacting me, and I'll repeat them later in the broadcast if you don't catch them this time. You can email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. You can text me on my cell phone, 479-841-7069. That's in the United States, so I'm not sure what prefix you might have to use in order to text me from another country. And of course, I can't cover the costs of that. But I would love to know a little bit more about you. Why are you listening to a mental health self-help podcast? How old are you? What are you hoping to get from listening to it? I just love a little bit of feedback from you. Thanks so much. Today, we're talking about perfectly hidden depression. These are people who inwardly are struggling with depression, at times even severe depression, but others would never, ever guess they were. Sometimes this is intentional hiding, but a lot of it is unconscious hiding. And all of it is about denying and avoiding pain or suffering. And these folks do it quite well. But I've called it a syndrome. And what is a syndrome? The actual definition of syndrome is... A group of symptoms that together are characteristic of a specific disorder, disease, or the like. What that means for perfectly hidden depression, or PhD as I'll call it, it's a set of behaviors, thought patterns, and emotions, or lack of emotions, that are found together in someone, kind of like you see red hair and freckles, or salt and pepper. When you see one, you're likely to see the other. So we're going to take in detail the 10 characteristics that make up this syndrome of perfectly hidden depression. It's not a diagnosis. It's not a disorder in and of itself. I'm trying to explain what I've seen as a clinician in that people are depressed, but they don't look depressed. And unfortunately, therapists can miss it. The first characteristic is perfectionism with a constant critical inner voice. 
Now, there are many people who think if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. It's maybe their favorite motto. But people with PhD silently berate themselves if they're not at the top at all times. You know, maybe they can laugh it off that they couldn't skate if their life depended on it or they can't tell a joke. But if it's an activity or a pursuit that is meaningful to them, it needs to be perfect. They have to be a perfect mom, an accomplished lawyer, head of the class, the best friend you've ever had. I worked with someone many years ago who actually helped turn me on to the idea of perfectly hidden depression. She was a very successful business person. She came in due to some sexual abuse in her history, and we did work on it, but I noticed that she would often smile as we were talking about it, and she seemed to kind of discount its importance even though she was in therapy. Then I began working with her and her husband. They were having some marital issues. And one day, I got a desperate call from him. I happened to be off that day, and he said he couldn't get in touch with her. And would I run over to the house? He was worried. Well, sure enough, I managed to get into the house. I felt like a a burglar, and she was trying to commit suicide. So I obviously called 911. It turned out that she was okay. Just to let you know what the situation looked like when I got into her home, everything was perfect. There were damp dish towels hanging out to dry. There wasn't a toy in sight, and she had three children. The only aspect of her life that wasn't perfect was the pill bottle by her side. She went into residential treatment, and we had our work cut out for us. But that's one of the first people that I said, you know, there's something here I need to pay attention to. It's that perfectionism. I had noticed that in her in our early work together. The second characteristic of this syndrome, again, is a heightened or excessive sense of responsibility. People with PhD are very aware of duty, obligation, and loyalty. They can be counted on. They're the first one to notice when something's going wrong and they look for solutions. They're not great delegators, but they make good leaders. However, this sense of responsibility, which obviously can be a good thing, can be very painful to them because they will readily blame themselves rather than taking a moment to understand the entire picture. And guess what? In relationships, they can be manipulated by those who rarely take responsibility. For example, they may end up with a narcissist, someone who will easily blame them, and then that goes through their filter of PhD, and they will accept blame when it is not theirs. The third characteristic is, is difficulty with accepting and expressing painful emotions. I know when I'm sitting in front of someone and they're talking about a loss or a disappointment, if they're smiling brightly at me, I may have discovered someone else who's hiding, who has perfectly hidden depression. At least it's a question I begin to ask myself as a therapist. Anger, that's avoided. Sadness, that's banished to the back of the closet. Disappointment is for whiners. That's what someone with PhD would think. It's interesting, someone with this kind of dynamic may not even have words to express these emotions, and in more severe cases, they may have trouble expressing emotion at all, of any kind. The perfectly hidden depressed person stays in her or his head most of the time, rather than connecting with their heart. I have a patient I'm working with right now, in fact, he and I look at a chart that's usually taught to children about how to express their emotions, what words they use. He's getting better, but it's very hard for him to put words to feelings, and people with perfectly hidden depression can have that problem. Number four is the worry or need for control over herself and her environment. I'm saying her for this particular trait. However, men also have perfectly hidden depression. Someone with PhD really has trouble staying in the present. If she does yoga, she may hate the final position where you're supposed to breathe and relax. He may love to cook, but he has a very hard time sitting with his diners and just enjoying the meal. The need for control is strong, and so a lot of time is spent worrying about the things that might occur to interrupt or screw up that control. And yet remember, It's important that someone with perfectly hidden depression disguise the worry. They're not going to tell people they're worried. They're not going to tell people that they fear things getting out of control. 
So it might not be obvious that this kind of anxiety exists. In fact, someone with perfectly hidden depression will look as if they do things with ease and no effort. The worry is hidden right under a smile. The fifth trait is intense focus on tasks, using accomplishment as a way to feel valuable. Stephen King once said, you're only as good as your last book. Well, this is the kind of thing that someone with perfectly hidden depression believes. They do all the time, and then they count on that activity and accomplishment to hide inner insecurities and fears. Now, we all do this to a certain extent. It feels good to get something done, maybe that you've been putting off, or you get a promotion at work, or someone emails you about how kind you were to them and how meaningful it was. There's obvious value in purpose and effort. Accomplishment isn't a bad thing in and of itself, but someone with perfectly hidden depression may carry it too far. If I ask someone with perfectly hidden depression, what do you like about yourself? They'll often answer that with things that they have accomplished, things they've done, rather than traits about themselves. They have a hard time having a true sense of esteem about who they are, not what they've done. Now, about this time, you may be asking yourself, well, how do these people get this way? In many ways, that's a podcast in and of itself, which I'm going to jot down a note, a quick note, and tell myself to do that. So you can be looking for that. There are several starting points or beginnings for perfectly hidden depression. I'm learning more and more of those, again, as I get emails and talk with people. So there are several paths to perfectly hidden depression. But at least I think part of what's so important is people have to identify themselves as having it before they can do anything about it. So that's why we're focusing on identification. So the sixth trait is active concern about the well-being of others while not allowing anyone into his inner world. It's important to say that this isn't insincere concern. It's real. Caring for others is what people with perfectly hidden depression do very well. However, they're not going to let others sense their own vulnerability. They don't reveal pain from their past to others. Their spouse might know, but it's not discussed. There's a wall up against anyone discovering that they're lonely or fatigued, empty or overwhelmed. And this, of course, can be especially troublesome and frightening when suicidal ideation is present. And whoever has perfectly hidden depression can't let anyone in. Or let's say he or she does. Then they may not be believed. They get told things like, what, you depressed? You've got everything in the world going for you. And the moment is missed. This can be devastating. Many of us probably know someone who committed suicide, and people look around and say, well, they look great. I didn't notice that there was a problem. And so my suspicion, obviously there can be some other kind of secret, but there may very well have been perfectly hidden depression. The seventh trait is discounting or dismissing hurt or abuse from the past or the present. There's a fancy psychology sounding word called compartmentalization. It's the ability to be hurt, sad, disappointed, whatever, about something, and then you put those feelings away until a time that you can deal with them better. Healthy people do this all the time. You can do it even with joy or happiness. Sometimes it's just not the time to be really, really happy about something because of what's going on in your environment, right? But people with perfectly hidden depression over compartmentalize. They've developed these incredibly strong boxes that they habitually lock painful feelings in and then shove them back into the dark recesses of their minds. This particular strategy allows them to discount, deny, or even dismiss the impact of life experiences that caused pain in the past, and then it can be also happening in the present. For example, one woman identifying with perfectly hidden depression emailed me recently that she'd been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And what she did with it, she wrote, what happened to me was no big deal. Much worse things have happened to other people, and she did not get treated for it. She even said later that she had thought that perhaps the diagnosis was a mistake. Well, it wasn't a mistake. She was just actively discounting. Number eight is there are 
accompanying mental health issues involving control or escape from anxiety. People with perfectly hidden depression live their lives in an extremely controlled fashion. So you'll find eating disorders, for example, which of course are not about food. They're about control and esteem. You'll find obsessive compulsive traits. You'll find that alcohol or sedative medications are being used to escape anxiety as well. Not in a way that causes attention to the person with perfectly hidden depression, but it can be a part of their functioning. Number nine is a strong belief in counting your blessings. Now, please don't get me wrong. I think counting your blessings is very important. It's healthy. It keeps you optimistic and grateful. But a person with perfectly hidden depression feels guilt or even shame if they show compassion toward themselves and allow themselves to realize that just because there are good things in their life doesn't mean there aren't things that they can complain about or that they struggle with. And that it's okay to admit and reveal that struggle. I recently had someone Facebook message me asking the question if anger was associated with perfectly hidden depression. And my response was usually it's denied or avoided or over compartmentalized, as we were saying a few minutes ago. And she said that one of her problems was giving herself permission to feel angry. And she really couldn't do that. So she acted it out against herself. And I think this ties in with what we just talked about because she she sounded as if she felt guilt for her anger rather than accepting that sometimes anger is a very normal response and that it's okay to feel it. The tenth and last characteristic or trait is that intimate relationships may be difficult, but they're accompanied by professional excess. Here's the point. The vulnerability that is linked with true intimacy is hard for someone with perfectly hidden depression. Although driven to be productive and achieve and often finding great success, they aren't likely to be someone who can easily relate on an intimate level. I had a guy email me who said he definitely identified with perfectly hidden depression and he was on his third marriage. He said the first two marriages didn't have a chance because he was not going to be vulnerable. He was acting like he thought he should, but he was not emotionally invested in the marriages at all. His ex-wives had no clue who he really was or what he really struggled with. Then another problem can be that sometimes someone with perfectly hidden depression will choose someone to be in an intimate relationship with that's also very uncomfortable with painful emotions. So they're very busy people. They do things. They may be very focused on their children, but it's not who they are for each other or what they know about each other that has any sense of intimacy to it. It's what they do for each other. Sometimes, I guess, it feels very convenient. So those are the 10 characteristics of perfectly hidden depression. If you have these characteristics and you identify, the journey is deciding that you don't have to hide. I'll have a link to a questionnaire in the show notes that may help you figure out where you are on this spectrum of perfectly hidden depression. You can listen, of course, to episodes three and four. And please realize that there are many others just like you who are hiding and keeping secrets. If someone you love has these traits, please get them to listen to this episode (laughs) or turn them on to my website at drmargaretrutherford.com. They will hopefully feel very seen and loved. And it could be the catalyst that would allow them to seek help. And if you're a therapist or a counselor or a doctor, please realize that depression doesn't always look the same. They don't always present with depressed mood and anhedonia. You have to listen and look very carefully. So now I want to read an email from someone who actually saw one of my blog posts on panic disorder. And here she goes. Dear Dr. Rutherford, I want to thank you for mentioning your panic disorder. When my now 21-year-old daughter was in high school, we had the frightening experience of trying to understand her panic attacks. She, too, shook inexplicably, and we brought her to the emergency room several times in a month. She had MRIs and saw a neurologist, but no one mentioned that the shaking was consistent with panic disorder. Her episodes ended as mysteriously as they came. Please continue to share your story. 
It's more than brave. It's very greatly appreciated. What she's referring to is I've done several posts on my own panic disorder, and one of my major symptoms is that I tremble. Now, of course, I don't know if this young woman had panic attacks or whether there was some strange, mysterious physical illness that she had, but it certainly could be panic. Here's how I responded to her. I very much appreciate your kind words and I'm glad my story helped you and your daughter. It's hard sometimes for me to believe how physicians don't take psychological issues into consideration, but I recognize we all have our own filters through which we hear information and I need to make sure mine considers medical issues. It's really the reason why I'm reading this email. It's a very simple email. But I wanted to make the point that it's important to consider that there could be psychological aspects to symptoms, but there also could be medical aspects of symptoms. I always try to remember, for example, if I have someone with episodes of agitation or episodes of fatigue, that I say, you know, you need to go talk to a doctor about your thyroid, because sometimes those things can mimic each other. And what I might take as hypomania or depression is really a problem in the endocrine system. So one of the first things you need to do if you're having health concerns or what are called somatic symptoms, things that are changes in your body, then please seek both medical and psychological help. And now for the big announcement. (laughs) I'm really delighted to share with you that I now have a gift book on Amazon. It's called Marriage is Not for Chickens. (laughs) I wrote it three years ago, and we've literally been spending the last two years looking for photographs that would work well with the 24 statements I have of what marriage is and what marriage is not. Some of them are funny, some of them are poignant, but the post was on the Huffington Post, and it far outshone any post that I've ever written with 200,000 likes and over 50,000 shares. It was incredible. So you might want to go on Amazon and pick up Marriage is Not for Chickens. It'd be a great gift for people who are about to get married, for anniversaries. I've never sold anything. Everything on my website is free and I don't have any advertising. So this is kind of new for me, but I'd love for you to get a copy of the book. The photographs that we have found are gorgeous and I was very honored to be working with those two photographers, Christine Mathias and Deborah Strauss. Marriage is not for chickens. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Self Work. If you're struggling with perfectly hidden depression, I certainly hope that you'll seek help. You can contact me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com, and I will answer you. My website, where I have lots of posts on perfectly hidden depression, as well as eating disorders and relationship problems, anxiety, sexual trauma. I've included lots of diverse kinds of topics for my blog post, just like this podcast. (laughs) So that's DrMargaretRutherford.com. I'm on Twitter at Dr. Underscore Margaret, and I tweet every now and then, probably at least once a day. I've already given you my cell phone number, which is 479-841-7069. That's in the United States. And I'll hope you'll reach out to me. Like I said at the beginning of the podcast, I'd love to hear from you about who you are and why you're listening. I'd just like to get to know you a little bit better. So hopefully I'll hear from you. I'd love it if you gave me a rating or review on iTunes. That really helps self-work become more well-known. I don't have anything to offer you to do that. (laughs) I wish I could offer you a therapy session, but I don't think that's particularly ethical. (laughs) But I'd love it if you could find the few minutes it would take to give me a rating and review. And subscribe. My numbers are going up, which keeps me going. Thanks so very much. I'm Dr. Margaret, and you've been listening to self-work.